of you who are showing up, um, this is going to be in voice. Um, if you don't hear me in voice, then me telling you right now that it's going to be in voice probably doesn't do a lot for you. But it makes me feel good because then I can claim that I said something. Um, I will start in just a couple of minutes. I see some people still coming in. I see Jess has made it. Wait, Jess, are you an Egyptian god now? You are. Which which Egyptian god are you? Anubis. All right. Very good. One of these years I will give a talk as a T-Rex, but uh, we'll see. Get yeah, the voice. I don't know how to do the voice. Um, let's see which sh which Shakespeare was this that Vic just linked to. Ooh, the audio quality is not very good on that recording. It's uh, peeking out a lot. But yeah, that was the uh, that was the mousetrap scene. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and get started. So um, I'm going to talk today about the history of astronomy. And you're wondering, why does he do this? Usually he talks about black holes and things. Uh, and the reason I'm doing this is because I am teaching a class this semester, co-teaching with a philosopher slash religious studies person um, entitled Scientific Discovery in the Renaissance. I am the science guy. He's the history guy, more or less. And we're looking at the Renaissance, a lot of Italian Renaissance, although eventually, of course, we get to Newton as sort of the capstone of all of it. But a lot of stuff happened down there in Italy. You may have heard of this guy, Galileo. There was another guy, Copernicus, who was from Poland, which is, I'm not sure where in Italy Poland is, but, you know, it's got to be down there somewhere, right? Um, yes. So um, I actually talked about Copernicus in class just about a week ago, and so I'm, I'm harnessing some could say um, being lazy and reusing some of the slides and information that I put together for that class, although I did add some things for this. You will see I did not use my Second Life animation that I'll show you a little later in class. But anyway, so I want to talk about Copernicus. And here's the thing. If you know anything about the history of astronomy, but you don't know a lot about the history of astronomy, which is probably most of us, which honestly includes me, even though I'm an astronomer, uh, I'm going to, so I'm going to go into an aside to my aside. If you're a physicist or an astronomer, you approach scholarship a lot differently from a lot of other fields. Well, I guess scientists in general do. In that, if you are, if you are a humanist or if you're a historian, you will have read the seminal works, the classic works of your field. But here I am. I'm a physicist. I've never read Newton's Principia. Because why? Because there's way better ways of learning and talking about Newton's laws than trying to read Newton's original stuff nowadays. So it's just a different mode of operation. Um, yeah, Physics by Asimov was a great popular science writer who wrote about 10 million different things. And uh, yeah, I know very little about alchemy. And so you know, if you want to learn about alchemy, maybe then Newton is the right one to read, uh, apparently. But yeah, so, so science operates a little bit differently. So if you know a little bit about the history of astronomy, you have this idea, which is correct, that there was this Ptolemaic model that put the Earth at the center of everything, and all the other planets orbited it, and planets meant something a little different. Once upon a time, a planet was a wandering star. So the sun and the moon would be considered planets, and the Earth would not be considered a planet back in the day. There were seven planets, wandering stars with regular cycles. There were also guest stars or cosmic visitors, which were things like comets that would come by once and go away. That was the idea. And then um, in the uh, 16th, did I say that right, 16th century, 15th century? Looks like right on the cusp of the 16th century, there was Copernicus introduced the heliocentric model, and it was way simpler. You didn't have all the epicycles that uh, Ptolemy had. You just had things going in circles around the sun. It got improved and sort of shown that it was a way better way to think about things with Galileo. Tycho Brahe took a lot of data. And Kepler was able to fit that data very well with what we call Kepler's laws that we still teach in introductory astronomy classes today that describe orbits as ellipses. And then Newton came along and said, hey, here's a universal gravitation law that I can derive Kepler's laws from. And that's, that's sort of the idea you have. One of the things I learned reading into this is that 
Copernicus had epicycles, and that's why I've titled this presentation Copernicus's epicycles. Copernicus actually wasn't epicycle free, and Copernicus's model had almost as many epicycles, or about the same number as Ptolemy's did. I was telling the other astronomer at uh, uh, Westminster this the other day, and he's like, what? No! I thought the whole point was he could explain retrograde motion without epicycles. And well, yes, he can, and he does. He used the epicycles for other purposes, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But, uh, you know, science has changed a lot. That's one of the points of this course I'm teaching, and that the word science wasn't even used until more recently. And originally it was the nova scienta. It was just the new knowledge is what it really meant. And eventually we abbreviated it down to science, and now it doesn't mean all of knowledge. It means something more specific, although you can find some people who think that anything that's not science doesn't really count as knowledge, and those people are fond of raging on the Internet. Um, it's sort of like bus. If you track down the Latin, where does bus come from? So in English, when we talk about a bus, it's a big vehicle that carries around a lot of people. Bus is just a suffix, uh, and somehow that became the word. So it's kind of interesting. Anyway, so I'm going to talk in particular about heliocentrism and a fair amount about Copernicus's model, although I do want to talk about some other stuff. Um, one thing that's kind of cool about Copernicus is that if you, in Poland, he shows up on their 1,000-whatever-that-thing-is uh, note. I have no idea how much that is worth. Uh, and in the U.S., for the most part, we've had political figures on our um, currency. We've lots of presidents, the occasional Ben Franklin-type guy. You know, sometimes we have somebody a little bit different, but for the most part, it's political figures. I really like that some countries put important figures from the history of science on their currency. Uh, and meanwhile... Anyway, I have, I have my snarky comment here. Um, but if we look back to, well, it's not really pre-heliocentric because history is never as, as simple as um, you'd like it to be. But for 1,500 years in Western Europe and also in most of the Arab world, the model that dominated our idea of what the universe was and the way we used to calculate where to find planets and things like that was Ptolemy's model of the solar system, which was the concentric crystalline spheres model. It was based on earlier work. Aristotle had this idea that everything was, all the planets were riding on perfect crystalline spheres. Aristotle's model had problems in that planets moved in ways that you would never see with just his crystalline spheres. And so Ptolemy was able to clean that up with epicycles. And I'll show you that shortly, what the whole point was. So Ptolemy really did a tour de force of taking the ideas that people had and making the model really work. And for more than a millennium, people were able to make pretty accurate predictions of where to find planets in the sky. And of course, one of the main reasons they were doing this was, oh, I need to get myself a face palm gesture before I say this, for astrology so they could predict the future. Yes, it's sad and true that once upon a time, astrologers and astronomers were kind of the same thing, and astronomers, whether or not they really believed they could predict the future, knew that that's where the money was, and so that's what they did. Um, unfortunately, nowadays, we have these things like professional ethics that prevent us astronomers from making all kinds of money selling horoscopes. Um, uh, with the, yeah, so the spheres idea, the extraterrestrials were believed to be made by deities, Yes, or it was a different realm from the Earth. So back in Aristotelian physics, the heavens and the Earth are two different things. Um, and you don't expect the same laws to apply to both. And so one of the things about, now of course, it wasn't completely new with Newton, but one of the important things about Newton is that he unified gravity in the heavens and on the Earth, that it was the same gravity that did both. So, yeah, so the divine was supposed to be perfect because that was just the way it was. You know, how could it be any other way was the notion. And that's why there were perfect spheres out there. And people, you know, twisted themselves into knots trying to maintain spheres. And I'll talk about that. But it's not as insane as it sounds, actually. So, anyway, here at the, uh, yeah, the music of the spheres, as the crystalline spheres uh, rubbed against each other, they would... Uh, resonate and you get the music of the spheres at least this was a poetic idea that some had i, I kind of like that poetic idea so the basic idea is this is um well it's it, you see the two sides of, of earth's globe uh this painting was done in 1568 so it's sort of a renaissance view of the ptolemy's models yeah the spheres would play ragtime um in particular 
in um, Rome in about uh, you know 1200. It was the Vatican rag is mostly what they were playing. So yes, you can look that up on YouTube at some point. Anyway, um, you've got the Earth at the center. Um, then there's a series of concentric orbs or spheres outside it. You probably can't read all the text, but if you focus over here, you might recognize some of the pictures. So, hey, look, that's a little picture. There's a full moon and a crescent moon right next to each other. Um, and then you have the symbol of Mercury and Venus and the sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the firmament. The firmament on the outside, also sometimes called the celestial sphere. Sometimes these were called celestial spheres, plural. The celestial sphere was the one on the outside, also called the firmament, where the fixed stars, as they were called, rode. And the idea was the Earth sits there, and all these orbit around the Earth, and that's why we see them moving. The firmament rotates at one specific rate, and all the others, and then the sun rotates at a different specific rate, and the moon at a different specific rate, and all the rest had to have epicycles to explain the way the motion worked. And so this was the idea that most of Europe and the Arab world and India and places like that had for over a millennium of the way things worked. And yes, yeah, sometimes people would play with other ideas, but this was the dominant model. And as I said, it was a very useful calculated... Oh, Here's somebody who actually knows about music telling us what the music of the spheres was. So there you go. Um, there was, um, it was, anyway, it was, it was very useful for over a millennium. You know, why would you even mess with it? You're doing a good job calculating. It seems to explain everything you see, but there were little wrinkles going along with it. Now, epicycles. We've mentioned epicycles a few times. Why bother with epicycles? And this is why. Um, this is an image uh, taken over time by this guy, Tung Tizzle. I don't know how to pronounce his name, but anyway. He um, took pictures of Mars in front of where it is in the sky. Actually, I don't know if he took pictures or if he rendered this, but I think there is some astrophotography in here. And over the course of several months, this is Mars relative to the background star. So, of course, every night it rises and sets. So you wouldn't actually see it whipping around the sky like this. But if you kept track of where it was, say, every several days, over the course of several months, you'd see Mars moving to the left. And then it turns around and moves back to the right. And then it turns around and moves back to the left again. And that's what Mars looks like on the sky. Now, in a purely Aristotelian model, where Mars is just orbiting the Earth at a different rate from the background stars, and at a constant rate, you would never get this. You, Mars would always go to the left relative to the background stars. And so this is called retrograde motion. Retrograde because it's going backwards from the way it's usually going. And there, Vix tells you when it's going to happen this year. So go. But of course, again, you can't see this in one night. One night, you find Mars. It's there. It's red. Um, you have to watch it over the course of weeks to notice that it's going forward and then backwards and then forward again. And you have to have a good enough sky that you can sort of see what stars are nearby. Um, but of course, a, you know, careful observations of the sky is something that humanity has been doing for millennia. So we've known about this. And Ptolemy put in his epicycles, which was a little wheel on top of a wheel in order to make Mars sometimes go backwards and sometimes go forward. Yeah, and also Sissigi points out that it's all not on a single line, that there's a there's a tilt to it because it's not just thrashing back and forth, but it's making a little loop-de-loop. -loop. And so as a result, Ptolemy is able to explain this by having the epicycle be tilted relative to the deferent, which is where things were before. Um, and yeah, and if you add enough fudge, you can make any data confirm to anything. So this is the um, this is the 101 Sissigi, Sissigi, Sissigi. Soft J. This is the 101 version of epicycles, and the idea is here's the Earth. It's at the center. Um, I've just drawn one thing. This is Mars. Why Mars? I Mars in particular because Mars was the one that vexed Kepler the most, and everybody else because of the bright planets, it has the most elliptical orbit. It's still very close to a circle, but it's elliptical enough that more so than the others, and actually the ancient Greeks and Copernicus and all these guys had observations good enough to know that the others couldn't be perfect circles. But Mars is the one where that's easiest to see. So that's why I talk about Mars a lot. Also, Mars is cool, right? It's got a good Holst movement and things like that. So here's the Earth at the center. The deferent is the primary orbit of Mars or of whatever planet is going around um, the Earth. So you've got the firmament way the heck out here somewhere. 
um, moving at one rate, Mars moving at a different rate. So relative to the firmament it, or the celestial sphere or the background stars, Mars is going. So imagine you're standing here on the Earth with your head sticking out of the page. Mars is going to the left. That would be a northern hemisphere observer. And we are, of course, very northern hemisphere biased because that's where most of the culture we're talking about comes from, although not all of it, because some of the um, Arab astronomers were much more equatorial. Then, riding around on this is the epicycle. So you imagine the epicycle as being fixed to the deferent. So as the deferent rotates, the epicycle is carried around with it. The epicycle itself rotates, and Mars rides on the epicycle. So you get this spirograph action going. And I'll show you a Copernicus version of an uh, epicycle working a little bit later. But for now, um, this is just the Ptolemy one. Mars would go around on this. Um, this whole thing would go around it, so you can see how you would get loop-de-loop -loop motions, just like with a spirograph. And so from the point of view of Earth, it would look like Mars is going back and forth. And then tilt the epicycle a little bit, and you'll get the looping motions that we saw. Right? And great. And so now you can explain retrograde motion. The problem is you still can't do a very good job of precisely predicting where Mars is. Um, do they allow the... To be a different, yeah, that's they did, and so the, the and that's what I mean when I say the epicycle was tilted a little bit. The deference is going to be in one plane, um, and each planet has its it all, they're all tilted very slightly. It corresponds basically to what we call the inclination of the orbit now, uh, or the deferent, yeah, also because of the inclination of Earth's orbit, right? So you put that together with the inclination of the planet's orbit, and that gives you how the deferent and the epicycle have to be tilted relative to each other. Oh, yes, qualitatively, you can explain retrograde motion, but you start doing the calculations, and it still doesn't work quite right if you try and look in detail exactly where you find Mars. So the model didn't quite fit the data. It was important. They wanted to keep circles, and they wanted to have some sort of uniform circular motion. At the very least, you have to have something that's um, calculatable, so it can't just be, oh, it's random, and it's whatever it needs to be, because at that point, it's not a good predictive model. So you want it to be uniform. Well, so Ptolemy's actual model becomes much more complicated in order to make it all work. The Earth, turns out, wasn't actually at the center. Um, this is one of the things about geocentric models. Ptolemy's model isn't exactly geocentric because the center is this. He gave it the name of the eccentric is what the center is called. The Earth is a little bit offset from the center, which is maybe a little distressing if you want the Earth to be the center of everything. But I think you can quickly reason your way out of this if you are, say, a medieval Christian using Ptolemy's model, um, because you can make a reference to the fall and say that once man had sinned, we were no longer at the center of things, but pushed off to the side. Or I, I don't know. I'm making this up as I go along. But in any event, in Ptolemy's model, the Earth was a little bit offset from the center. So the thing that all the deference were rotating around was where this cross is, and the Earth was offset a little bit from that. And already that helps you modify elliptical motion. Um, if you an ellipse with moderate eccentricity just looks like an offset circle. You have to actually look at it pretty closely to tell that it's squashed. It just looks like a circle a little bit off to the side. And Mars's orbit, if you look at an actual orbit of, of the solar system, mostly looks like an offset circle. So great, that's most of it, but there's still this problem that it wasn't getting the rates at which the planets were moving across the sky right. So then he introduced this other thing called the equant, the equant is offset from the eccentric, and the equant is the point about which planets move at a uniform rate. So you have planets now, and they're moving. The, the epicycle's orbiting around on the deferent, and the planet's orbiting around on the epicycle, and they're moving at a uniform rate about this point, as measured from that point. So they're actually not uniform on their circles themselves. So it's you can see already it's become a pretty complicated model, a little hard to even kind of understand everything you're looking at. And then if you imagine actually doing calculations with this, it gets trickier still. But Ptolemy made lots and lots and lots of uh, calculations and tables and um, prescriptions for how you, you measure these things. And uh, people use them for a long time. I, you know, I don't think Copernicus actually did a lot of measurements themselves. I think he got measurements from other people, including lots of historical measurements, but also some modern measurements. I don't believe he himself did a whole lot of the actual measuring on the sky. Tycho Brahe did, although that was a little bit later. Um, 
but he so um, Copernicus did get measurements from various people. And I can't tell you off the top of my head who they were. Anyway, so that's so the real Ptolemy model was pretty complicated. And then if you actually look at the whole solar system, it's like, oh, what's going on here? Well, normally it would be rendered as spheres. But what I've done is tried to give you approximately a scale model of the Ptolemy model. And if you have to zoom really close in, right at the center here, and you'll see there's a little tiny gray circle. That tiny gray circle is the orbit of the moon around the Earth, which actually in Ptolemy's model and um, yeah, oh yeah, Ptolemy did use earlier work by Hipparchos. This is definitely true. He he built on other stuff that people had done. So what his contribution was, uh, I think he introduced the equant. I don't think Hipparchos had that. Um, and his contribution was also making the whole thing very precise and work very well. And then he also basically wrote what was considered the um, seminal textbook on astronomy for many years. Yeah, and so all right, here's the Earth 2 theory is very important in Second Life because, of course, there's this really horrible set of awful hack novels called Gore, uh, which is the Earth 2. And then that makes a really bizarro, weird subculture that I have never understood because people like to pretend to be slaves. Um, that turns out to be pretty big in Second Life. But maybe somebody here can explain Gore because I just don't get it. I don't get the appeal. Uh, but whatever. I know it's big in Second Life when I worked at Linden Lab. You know, you start to learn things about like what gore is that maybe you wished you hadn't known, but whatever. So anyway, back to Ptolemy's orbit. So the little tiny gray circle is the orbit of the moon around the Earth. And they actually had a halfway decent idea of how big the moon's orbit around the Earth was um, from measurements of parallax. Basically, look at the moon from different two different points on the surface of the Earth. And if you can do it during something like a solar eclipse where you have something else to compare it to, you can figure out... Um, you can figure out how far away the moon is. And so they had a pretty decent idea about how big that orbit was. So there's that. The Earth is in the equant, all that, or at the center. And of course, yeah, the equant's not the same for every planet. <laughs> Dirty secret. But it's at the center of all that. And then you have Mercury's orbit. It's this little orange thing. And Mercury does have an epicycle. It's small, so you can't see it. Now, Venus, the brown one, you can see Venus and its epicycle. Um, sun, no epicycle. Mars and its huge epicycle, because Mars is eccentric enough uh, that you need a pretty big epicycle to make the whole thing work. Jupiter and its epicycle, Saturn and its epicycle. And then these whole things had to be nested like this, at least this far apart, so their epicycles didn't run into each other, because you don't want the spheres crashing into each other. Um, and then just outside Saturn, although they didn't really know, have a real way of knowing how far away, and different people had different ideas, but the sort of dominant idea was that it was like a jewel box, and just outside Saturn was the firmament enclosing all of this with all of us nicely inside it. And then the celestial sphere, that's what the fixed stars are on the celestial sphere. One idea that I kind of like the sound of is that the celestial sphere is actually an opaque sphere with little holes in it. And what we see as stars are the divine radiance from beyond, from the realm of heaven shining through the celestial sphere down to us. Um, and yeah, um, okay, you can see it with the naked eye. Can you really see it with the naked eye? I thought it was a little dim for the naked eye. Um, it's just really, it's, all right, so, okay, so you can see it with the naked eye, but I'm guessing when you did that, you knew where to look, and you were looking very carefully, because there's going to be bunches of stars in the general area that are about the same brightness, and I would think it would take really careful and almost lucky observations to see it. Now, we've had this... Also, where people find Kuiper Belt objects nowadays, which require telescopes to see, go back and you look at archival data and you realize we've observed this thing before. It's just nobody had flagged it as a moving object. So um, so I'm actually not surprised they didn't see Uranus because magnitude 5.6, there's huge numbers of stars at 5.6 and they pepper the sky. And they don't, it doesn't jump out at you the same way that um, all the other planets do. So yeah, I mean, Uranus was discovered by William and Carolyn Herschel um, in the, what, 18th century? Something like that. In the past, that's all I know. Um, at z equals zero would be the cosmological description of the time. So um, this was Ptolemy's model, and this was the idea that uh, of how the universe worked. And because of various people like Thomas Aquinas, it got um, 
integrated into part of Christian theology somehow. There were some people who pointed out, hey, wait a minute, you guys with your worship of Aristotle and all this, those are pagans. We shouldn't approve. But somehow it became essential to Christian theology that, that Ptolemy's model of the solar system be correct. And so there it is. Now, it turns out, of course, there were pre-Copernican Copernicans, which is a really funny way to say it, but given that we talk about Copernican as being um, somebody who believes in a heliocentric solar system, well, there were people like that before Copernicus, and here are some notable examples. One of the earliest ones, although probably not really the earliest one, but the earliest one we can still identify was Histarchus, not Histarchus, Aristarchus, from about the 2nd, 1st century B.C., I guess that's the second century BC we're talking about. No, that's the third century BC. I have trouble with zero offset, even though I use it all the time in Python and C. Whatever. Those dates, that's uh, Aristarchus uh, talked about a heliocentric cosmology. Um, his work is not around. We can't find it anymore. But Archimedes has a, a piece called the Sand Reckoner where he writes at some length about what uh, Aristarchus said. So he, he had a model, the, the sun's at the center and the earth and the sphere of fixed stars, as he called it. So he still had a firmament, Aristarchus, was centered on the sun instead of the earth. So that's Aristarchus. That's maybe the really early one. And, of course, that being down and written by uh, the ancients, which were considered you know important old knowledge by both medieval Arabic culture as well as the Renaissance Europe. Uh, you know, it would be in there something that somebody could refer to. Um, Seleucos of Seleucia uh, in 150 BC recognized the tides as being something caused by the moon and was able to figure out that the position of the moon allows you to predict the tides and the relative positions of the sun and the moon allow you to predict how big the tides are. So, you know, he's a good little more than 2,000 years before uh, Bill O'Reilly claimed that you can't predict the tides uh, or can't explain the tides, and yet here he is kind of kind of explaining them a little bit. Really understanding how they work requires Newton's gravity, but, you know, we explain that all the time now, unless you believe in general relativity, which I do, in which case it's actually geodesic deviation, which is just a much more poetic name for it. Um, jump ahead a little bit. This is a Indian astronomer who is sometimes accused of being a heliocentrist, but he wasn't really, so his, his theory was geocentric, but some uh, historians and histories of science, historians of science look at what he put together and think that actually he probably started heliocentric, and either he or those who came after him modified it to make it geocentric. But one key thing he did have was Earth rotating on its axis. So if you have a geocentric um, cosmology, one of the reasons is because it just seems like the way things are, right? Go look. You see the sun rising and setting. Um, look at the stars. They're rising and setting. Look at the planets. They're moving across the sky. We sure feel like we're at the center. Once you have the Earth rotating, you've already set us in pretty fast motion, um, which starts to break the notion that what it looks like to a casual observer is the way it really is. So this guy, who was Indian, did have the notion of the Earth rotating on his axis. And, um, <clears throat> oh, look, so Vic has a, uh, uh, he's come to a reference to somebody before Aristarchus who was suggesting that the Earth was not the center. So this guy, Aribata, or however you pronounce the name, I'm probably doing it wrong, uh, did talk about Earth rotating on its axis. A couple more, if uh, we get into the, um, we get into the Arab world now, the medieval Arab world. And so if you look at between the fall of Rome and about 1300, uh, a lot of knowledge was lost to Europe. So a lot of the stuff that people had figured out in Roman times, Europe didn't have access to it anymore. Uh, it's called the Dark Ages, but if you say that in front of an actual historian who studies the medieval world, they will facepalm just about as hard as I facepalm when you say evolution is just a theory or something like that. So the Dark Ages is really sort of a stilted way of looking at it. Um, it turns out there was light during the Dark Ages, whereas cosmology's Dark Ages really were dark. Nothing was emitting light. So it's a good name there. Um, it wasn't that everybody was ignorant and superstitious, but they did 
they no longer knew about a lot of even in Europe they weren't all ignorant and superstitious. Um, they they did know a lot about yeah so lots of books got destroyed. There was the whole fire at Alexandria which didn't help, but of course that was long before the fall of Rome. Um, they just didn't. They had lost a lot of geometric and mathematical and astronomical knowledge. There's this guy Gerbert around right around year one thousand who became a pope. And he was one of the best mathematicians of his day. And some people actually said, it's like, oh, he must be consorting with demons if he knows this much math. So, yeah, there's some, uh, there's some superstition around, as there always is, and there is today, too. But um, his, he, you know, his writings are struggling to explain stuff that Euclid had explained a lot earlier so he's he's a brilliant guy but he clearly doesn't have access to the stuff that he would have loved to have access to and yeah and then baragon points out that why did anything survive a lot of it was the monks um yes and also lucretius pointing out that literacy was was almost um monopolized by the church however uh, in the Arab world, things were a little bit different. The Arab world did not have a single politically dominant religious power the way Europe did. There wasn't a Catholic church, per se, in the Arab world. Um, literacy was a little more widespread. And thanks to uh, just how things worked out historically, they, had, they still had access to a lot of the knowledge the ancient Greeks came up with, and they translated it into Arabic, as well as knowledge the ancient Persians had come up with. So... And they were in contact with the Indians. And so as a result, the Arabs were scientifically and mathematically far more advanced than the Europeans uh, back during that time. And, and they were, in fact, playing with heliocentric models. This one guy, Abu Mashar, um, he has a epicycle-free table of planetary periods. Is this really because he had a heliocentric model? Don't know. But it sort of implies that because planetary periods without epicycles are not as useful um, in a geocentric model, because you really need the epicycles to make things work out right. And uh, there's this other guy, Al Biruni, who considered heliocentric models, and he basically decided it was hard to decide which was right. Um, in fact, I have a quote of somebody who is looking at this. In fact, maybe hang on a second, because I just lost total control of my camera. Yeah, so this is Al Biruni looking at um, an earlier guy. So here's another name that I've highlighted. I have seen the astrolabe called Zurakia, invented by Abu Said Sijizi, however it's pronounced. Sijizi. I liked it very much and praised him a great deal, as it is based on the idea and entertained by some to the effect that the motion we see is due to the Earth's movement and not to that of the sky. By my life, it is a problem difficult of solution and refutation. For it is the same whether you take it that the Earth is in motion or the sky. For in both cases, it does not affect the astronomical science. It is just for the physicist to see if it is possible to refute it. So, so there is this idea that astronomy and physics are two separate things, which is carried to this day by some physicists who aren't astronomers in various physics departments who want to denigrate astronomy as not real science. Yes, I have been in one of those physics departments. Um, nowadays... Astronomy, physics, they're parts of the same thing, but the idea is back then, the astronomical sciences was, um, where do you see things in the sky? What's in front of what? And the physical sciences were more, and of course, physicist wasn't even really a word then, so I'm not sure what this was translated from, but um, physicists were the people who actually tried to figure out what was really out there and how things interacted and stuff like that. Yeah, and Vic has pointed to a, a science of Albiruni. So anyway, so all these guys are Copernicans before Copernicus. Copernicus wasn't necessarily aware of all their work, but he was aware of some of their work. Um, and, and so, I mean, I think Copernicus actually credited Aristarchus as inventing the whole heliocentric notion. Um, but he was clearly aware of some of the uh, work by these Arab astronomers as well. Copernicus's magnum opus was, of course, called the revolu the di revolu I can't pronounce it in... Latin, so we'll say the revolution of the orbs, right? That's the English translation. Um, he actually was working on that a lot of his life. He, it was his hobby, more or less, is that whenever he had a chance, he would go sequester himself in his room and work on his astronomical model. And he was hesitant to publish it because he knew that a lot of people would see it as heresy. 
but he didn't keep it secret either. So he told some people, and word was kind of out. And there were a lot of people, both in and outside the church. So it's you know the notion that the church wanted to suppress this knowledge isn't really right, because there were a lot of uh, scholars and such inside the church who said, oh, he's working on interesting stuff. Let's find out what it is. So a lot of people encouraged him to publish, and he did in the last year of his life, but he may have published earlier, or he did publish earlier just anonymously. And so this is a anonymous treatise um, that was much later, about a century later, identified by Tycho Brahe as being written by Copernicus um, that was entered into some archives that includes basically everything that was in his later work. At least it's got the, the basic ideas. And it includes this 1514, or it was actually probably before 1514, but that's when it was referenced in a, in a reference to an archive. Um, there is no one center which is very, this is actually what we would sort of call the Copernican principle nowadays, or the cosmological principle anyway. Um, the Earth's center is not the universe's center. So this goes with there is no one center. Different things have different centers. Um, the universe center is near the sun. Now, I will come back to what that is in a little bit. Um, you might have thought he should have said it's at the sun. Well, it turns out he's going to need a little equant light thing himself to offset the sun slightly from the center. Now, we today, first of all, when we say universe, we mean something very different. Back then, when they were talking about universe, they meant the solar system. And the notion was the firmament and the fixed stars or whatever it was, was just a single big thing at the edge, maybe really far away, but it wasn't a whole bunch of collection of other things just like the sun. Um, Giardo Bruno suggested it was like that, and he got burned at the stake for his uh, his temerity to suggest that maybe the other things were like suns. So the, when, when Copernicus is talking about universe, he's talking about what today we would say the solar system, and we would say that the center of the solar system is not really at the sun. It's close to the center of mass of the sun-Jupiter system, because Jupiter has most of the mass that's not in the sun. But that's not what Copernicus was thinking, because he didn't have Newtonian gravity and the notion of, of uh, Newtonian gravity center of mass and stuff like that. This next one here, whoa, what has he done here? Yeah, this is exactly how Copernicus wrote it. Uh, this is not how Copernicus wrote it. What I'm saying here is the distance to the sun is way the heck smaller than the distance to all the stars. That's one of his principles. Um, Earth's rotation accounts for the apparent daily rotation of the stars. Very modern view, of course. The annual cycle of the sun relative to the stars, which in Ptolemy's model was the sun orbiting the Earth, is actually caused by the Earth's revolution around the sun. And finally, the retrograde motions of the planet is caused by Earth's revolution around the sun. And this is the, the key thing. You don't need epicycles to get retrograde motion. Um, so these this these were the uh, this was the thing that was in that 1540 treatise. Um, of course, his magnum opus and the things we remember him for is um, the revolutions, as it is often called, and the fact that um, uh, did he recognize? I think that was much later, Vic. Although Copernicus did recognize that. I'm pretty sure Copernicus recognized, certainly Galileo did, that it was the light of the sun that was lighting up the other things. In fact, I had this on, on a previous slide here. Um, this is this is sort of was almost irrelevant, but from this guy, Abu Mashar, uh, this is one of his diagrams showing it is the light of the sun that we see reflected off the moon, and here's his diagram of the moon phases. So certainly that was an idea that was around then, that the sun was the thing that did all the light on all the planets. I mean, it's obvious if you're on Earth, the sun is up, it's brighter. The sun is down, it's darker. The light's coming from the sun. Look at the sun. You go blind. Okay. We can figure out the light's coming from the sun. But do the planets shine of their own light like the stars? Or are they reflecting sunlight? Well, today we know they're reflecting sunlight, at least in the optical wavelengths. If you look in the infrared, it might be a different story, depending on which wavelength you're at. Um, so, uh, you know, Copernicus had an idea, but I don't think he had the idea that the sun was one among many stars, that those little points of light were basically the same thing as the sun, the way we do. Anyway, so Copernicus's magnum opus is Die Revolution Ibis Orbium Celestium, uh, the revolution of the celestial orbs. Um, and so if you think about what do we usually call orbs, it means eyeballs. So he's talking about people rolling their eyes, pretty much, um, at least that's my interpretation, and you can't argue with it. And here is a, a, a quick drawing of his idea. Here's Sol at the center. And look, all the orbits, not to scale, but in their modern sorting. And here's the moon going around the Earth there. And I saw that uh, Chantal rezzed out a nice little Copernican Ori here that I will just move if I'm able to. 
Uh, yeah. Here's a little Copernican Ori that Chantal rezzed out um, that is sort of a uh, – somebody earlier mentioned Ori's in the Ptolemaic sense, which you see these big, huge um, framework spheres rotating around each other and spheres on spheres and such. So this is the Copernican version where you just have a bunch of – uh, arms holding the planets in place and orbiting around the sun, and they're all orbiting relatively at their right rate. So you can see Mercury whipping along, and the Earth and Mars moving, and you can hardly see Venus and Neptune moving. Of course, this is a little post-Copernican, because Copernicus didn't have Uranus or Neptune, but there you go. And it's actually a very, it's a nice little thing. So check that out, that thing I just moved over. This is Copernicus's ideas. Now, there is one big observational problem with Copernicus's model that Ptolemy's model doesn't have, and that is the notion of parallax. What is parallax? Well, in the Copernican model, or in reality, as I like to call it, um, the Earth goes around the sun. So here's the sun, which is more or less not moving relative to the other stars, you know, to, to decent approximation. It's, it's not moving very fast relative to the other stars. So here's the sun. This is some very distant star. I haven't drawn it distant on the diagram because drawing it to scale, you wouldn't be able to see anything because the stars are hundreds of thousands times farther away from the sun than the earth is from the sun. So that just doesn't work to scale. So I've drawn the star very close. Here's the sun. Here's the earth at two points in its orbit, two opposite points in its orbit. And if you think about what it would look like from the point of view of the Earth, you're looking at this angle, or this line is the direction you're looking, and you'd see the star in front of whatever stars are there. Whereas at this point in Earth's orbit, you're looking in this direction, you would see this star in front of whatever background stars are there. And if they're all on a single firmament, of course, they will all move together, but you would be able to see them wobbling around in the sky if the Earth was going around the Sun. Um, now, of course, today we know there are all different distances, so we see some moving relative to the others. The closer ones move relative to the farther ones from our point of view. But if you have a firmament, in Copernicus's model, there is this problem that you really ought to see parallax, and yet you don't. And Ptolemy's model wins a little bit here because if the Earth is right at the center and everything's orbiting around the center, you don't get any parallax. You're not moving, so you don't get any parallax. Yes, but Sissy G points, Sissy G points out the parallaxes are really tiny, and this was Copernicus says, well, I don't see parallax because the distance between the Earth and the Sun is imperceptible in comparison with the loftiness of the firmament. Uh, that is this guy's translation. Here is my translation of that sentence. Um, you could say that Copernicus actually predicted parallax, right? It's got to be there. It's just really small. And in fact, a few hundred years later, we did see that um, parallax happens, but it's because it's tiny. Uh, yeah, so Sun's giving us its arc 0.768 arc seconds. An arc second is 1 hundredth of a degree. And you don't think of a degree as being a very big angle. Another thing to compare it to is if you have a eight inch or bigger telescope and you look at the stars the atmosphere of earth the whole twinkling star effect is almost certainly blurring the star out more than the parallax of alpha centauri which is the closest star system so parallax is really hard to observe um, we do it nowadays with spacecraft and we've observed lots of parallaxes and they're very useful because we can use them to figure out distances but they're not easy to see and the reason was exactly here well not quite exactly you know, it's not that there's a firmament, but all the stars are so far away compared to the sun. Um, and in fact, here's another. So this is from his 1514 treatise. Here's from the orb revolutions. The heavens are immense by comparison with the earth and present the aspect of an infinite magnitude. He's careful there. He's not saying the universe is infinite. He's just saying it's freaking huge. So it might as well be infinite. Careful about current cosmology. Say, so, yeah, the universe is infinite, or at least it's freaking huge. What I should be saying is it presents the aspect of an infinite magnitude, and then I would sound better. A um, couple more quotes that I'm not going to actually talk because I'm, I don't have as much time as I thought I did. But basically, here he is saying, hey, retrograde motion, it works because the Earth is moving. Um, and he says, because nothing is preventing the Earth from moving, we'd better consider that it moves. Uh, and, and things might actually work better. So I just want to remind you 
Retrograde motion was the thing that was hard to explain and that you had to introduce epicycles and Ptolemy for it, but you don't need epicycles with Copernicus, and here's how that works. Um, here is the Sun, here is the Earth, and here is the Mars. I figure if we call this not Sun, Earth, we have to call it the Sun, the Earth, it becomes the Mars. And this dashed line um, is basically the direction from the Earth to Mars, and this is the firmament, or it represents the distant stars. So this dashed line shows you what point on the firmament, or which background stars, is Mars in front of. And we go along in our orbit, and a little while later, Earth has moved and Mars has moved, and Earth goes around its orbit a little faster than Mars does, and you can kind of see that by the spacing here. And uh, because of how they've moved, yes, from our point of view, if you're standing on the North Pole, so we're looking down on the North Pole here, you would say Mars has moved to the left. And a little while later, it's moved to the left again. A little while to the left, but notice it's slowed down. And sometime later, it's now moved to the right, so it stopped and turned around. And sometime later, oh, now it's taking time for stuff to res. I forgot to res out my... Uh, I usually res out a whole bunch of cubes to pre-res stuff, and I forgot to do that this time. So I will pause for a moment and let you res the screen, which was written by Troy McLuhan, who I haven't seen in years. I, is he even still around? Um, shows the other images on the other sides of the screen to kind of force your computer to download it. So anyway, back. Here it is. I'm hoping it's res for most of you now. Um, you see it going backwards, and then it turns around and goes forwards again, and eventually goes off on its merry way where it started from. So this diagram shows that... You don't need epicycles, you just need two nested circles, and you're looking from the point of view of one circle, and the planet's moving on the other circle, and you can just naturally get retrograde motion out of that. So that's, that's sort of the biggest win of Copernicus's model, is that it um, explains retrograde motion without needing whole bunches of other stuff. Uh, this is a modern idea of the solar system, kind of hard to see, but this is really drawn to scale, and this is why it's hard to see. Here you have the inner planets. The biggest circle is Earth's orbit. Um, down here you have the outer planets. The biggest circle is Neptune's orbit, and then there's this sort of ellipse coming through that's Pluto. Uh, and then you zoom out a thousand, ten thousand times to get to the nearest star. Um, I actually recommend this site, atlasoftheuniverse.com. I've been recommending this site for at least 15 years in talks because it, it's a good way of visualizing how things are. Okay, now here's the thing, though, that I started with. Copernicus had epicycles. And his ultimate reason, or sorry, not his ultimate reason, the real ultimate reason is that in nature, the orbits are elliptical, although I should say approximately elliptical. If it was just one planet orbiting the sun, it would be elliptical. As long as the planet and the sun were point masses, it would be perfectly elliptical. Um, in practice, as we on the Earth orbit the sun, Jupiter mostly, but the other planets give us little tugs that slightly modify our orbit a little bit. But to really good approximation, they're elliptical, um, and deviations from this simple circular motion are readily observed. Um, the ancient Greeks had done it. Um, Copernicus rejected Ptolemy not necessarily because of the simplicity, although he does point out, hey, look, you get retrograde motion just from this, but really because there was non-uniform motion in, in Ptolemy's circles. So Ptolemy, following the philosophy of the day, is thinking, yeah, we've got to have perfect circles because it's the divine and it needs to be perfect circle. And Copernicus wrote some stuff saying it's inappropriate to have non-uniform motion. The divine would never do such a thing. How can you imagine it? Um, no, Baragon, they all go retrograde in our solar system. Um, Mars is really obvious, but you can see it with Saturn, too. Um, Uranus, you can see it with all of them. So anyway, Copernicus wanted uniform motion, but even with his sun-centered model, he couldn't get it to work right because he had circles, not ellipses. So he was able to get it pretty close to right by doing two things, offsetting the sun from the actual center. See, there we've done an equant thing again. Um, so this is principle three, the universe is near the sun. And he also had um, epicycles to make the whole thing right. And I actually have, I've made a little model of, this is what I call my Copernicus simulator. And when I was making it, actually I was making it for my, a version for my class, my wife Allison asked me, when I said, I'm making a Copernicus simulator, she said, does it speak Polish? So what you'll probably want to do, this is going to raise out particles, and depending on your graphic settings, whether or not you'll see them, you may want to futz with your camera a little bit so that you can see the whole ring and then the smaller ring and then Mars on the top of the smaller ring. Um, and you might zoom in so you don't see a whole lot else. And I'm going to just start this thing running. 
Um, and yes, the president, it's presentation with Polish. Very good. That is excellent. And so here's what's happening. As this thing goes around, the blue circle is orbiting at one rate. The green circle is ro orbiting exactly twice as fast, and Mars is riding on the green circle. And as a result, you get some an orbit that's not quite a circle. Now, this is actually a really huge epicycle. Copernicus's epicycles were much smaller than Ptolemy's epicycles. And I'll show you in a little bit that you can make a really good approximation of an ellipse with a small epicycle. Now, if you look at the red dots here, if you know anything about ellipses, it doesn't look like an ellipse. It should look more pointy down at the bottom than it does. But you do get sort of this offset circle. You get the planet um, moving faster at some places than other places. Um, and so as a result, um, you get, you, you know, Copernicus was able to explain the orbit of, uh, of the planets pretty well. Now it turns out really what he's trying to do is approximate ellipses. And Ptolemy is also trying to approximate ellipses. And it turns out Ptolemy's approximation was actually a little better, not in terms of what is, but in terms of what you see on the sky. So the detailed calculations that Copernicus came up with were not quite as good as the detailed calculations that Ptolemy came up with. Um, and you know, for that reason, it didn't make sense to adopt Copernicus's model right away. So I'm going to move this guy. Yep, you have to have the two uh, synchronized to get even approximate elliptical. Otherwise, you'll get things like loop-de-loops. And actually, if you set it back, you can get all kinds of fun stuff if you change the rates. Basically, you're playing Spirograph. Um, so, you know, here's a static drawing of this. Now, here, the epicycle is really small. You can see there's a little tiny green circle here. Here's the center of the motion. Here's the sun offset from the center. Um, Right, so it's at what we would call the focus of the ellipse. And you can't even see it, but on top of the red circle, there's a purple circle, which is the ellipse with the sun at the focus. So that's the real orbit of planets, you know, what Kepler would eventually model. Um, blue is the main circle, green is the epicycle, and then red is the path that the planet follows. That's what the little red particles I was raising before are. And given that what is right and Copernicus's model, you can't even tell them apart in this drawing, you know it's a pretty good model. As the epicycle gets bigger, so this is this would be the epicycle you need for Mars just about. Um, it's a little bit bigger than the one you would need for Mars. I have this eccentricity of 0.1, and I think Vic told us Mars's eccentricity is 0 0.8, 0 0.08, or 0.09. And now you can start to see a deviation between the ellipse and the red circle. And as it gets bigger, the deviation gets bigger, you know, up to here. And this is closer to um, what I did in my model before. You can start to see it squashed over here, and it's really not getting the ellipse right anymore. But for small eccentricities, it works pretty well. And all of the planets in our solar system have small eccentricities. So Copernicus's model was actually quite good. It just turns out that if what you wanted to do was find where the planets are, Ptolemy's model was better. Now, it is sort of interesting. Um, why obsessed with circular motion? I mentioned this before, and here's, here's one thing Copernicus said. Um, first of all, we must note that the universe is spherical. The reason is that, of all forms, the sphere is the most perfect. Right? This is not science here. This is um, uh, preconception. Needing no joint and being a complete whole, which can be neither increased nor diminished, or that the most capricious of figures best suited to include, or sorry, capacious, not capricious, that's very different, or that it is the most capacious of figures best suited to enclose and retain all things. Very good. Um, other things. He says, the motion of the heavenly bodies is circular since the motion appropriate to sphere is a rotation in a circle. And here's, this is my favorite one. For this non-uniformity, he's talking about what if planets move faster at some times than others, kind of like Ptolemy kind of had him doing would have to be caused either by an inconsistency, whether imposed from without or generated from within, and the moving force by an alteration in the revolving body. <laughs> from either alternative, however, the intellect shrinks. It is improper to conceive any such defect in objects constituted in the best order. Basically, the skies are divine. They can't be imperfect like this. It's got to be uniform circular. So ignore the Ptolemy and pay attention to the me because I have uniform circles, and he doesn't. Um, and, you know, and basically other things. Now, this is, I'm not going to read this quote to you, but um, it turns out that you can model any motion with enough circles on top of enough circles. You know, 
he says here that it's got to be a circle because it's periodic and circles are how things are periodic and well yes but lots of other things are periodic too um, sines and cosines but if you know anything about Fourier analysis you know that any function you can model as long as it's not pathological with you know as long as it's a function and it's not pathological you can model it as a sum of sines and cosines and what that basically means is you sum up enough different circles and you can get whatever motion you want. Yeah, stack enough equations, stack enough circles on top of each other, and you can get an arbitrarily good model to anything. So, you know, he's not right, but he's not wrong in his statement here. Now, um, I, I am sort of curious when him saying how things need to be uniform circles, how he would react to an actual Newtonian three-body solution, such as this one, where you've got three things orbiting each other and kind of chaotically going all over the place. That's chaotic in both the qualitative sense and the technical sense, because this motion is chaotic, but that's a talk for a different day. Um, all right, I'm going to skip my next bit where I talk about how physicists today do exactly what Copernicus did, but having skipped that, um, it is worth thinking about at the end, Ptolemy versus Copernicus. You know, why? Put yourself in the mindset of other natural philosophers of the day and which model is the better model. And both of them have things in their favor. First of all, Ptolemy. It's what it looks like. Why make a mess when it's just apparent to the most apparent to the most casual observer that the sun is the thing that's rising and setting? Do you feel self-rotating? No, right? Do you feel the Coriolis force? You do not. Um, hurricanes do, but whatever. We don't understand them yet, so we're not going to say that. The ancients said so was actually a, an important. Or it's, this is one of the things that happened in Europe during the Renaissance, is that we moved away from thinking that authority, Aristotle said it, therefore it's true, the Bible said it, therefore it's true, as the ultimate arbiter of truth, to experience. Um, I think it was Leonardo da Vinci, in one of his notebooks, wrote this great thing um, about how experience should really be the thing that you use to decide, and not just because somebody said it was so. So, but back then, the fact that Aristotle and Ptolemy and the ancients said it was so was an important reason. Why would you contradict this? Um, here's the thing. Usually people like to say that Copernicus had a much simpler model. And he, while he has a simpler explanation for retrograde motion, to get everything, he had to put a bunch of epicycles in. And his number of epicycles was pretty much similar to Ptolemy's number of epicycles. So Copernicus isn't a win there. Ptolemy, they're equally complicated. Let's stick with the one we know. Um, we haven't observed stellar parallax, at least if it's 1500, we haven't. And Ptolemy, you don't expect to. And better precise predictions. Whereas on Copernicus's side, yes, we have a simpler explanation for retrograde motion. We have, at least from one point of view, better geometrical purity, because things are moving in uniform circles, not uniform around this equant. And there's this other thing that the orbital period sorting makes more sense. In Ptolemy's model, the deferent for Mars, not Mars, Mercury and Venus, moves at exactly the same rate as the sun. Whereas in Copernicus's model, the closer something is to the sun, the shorter its orbit. And so there's it sort of there's a sorting there that ultimately we would understand with Newton's laws as to why it has to happen. Kepler's laws would codify it precisely, but it sort of makes more sense that the things that are closer into whatever your center is going to the things that are farther away, that if the orbits are getting longer, shouldn't they all get longer? Well, that's kind of a hand wavy argument. But here's the thing is that if you're a scientist in the day, before you use the word, is the one that's going to say, well, look, his predictions are better than the other ones. He fits the data better than Copernicus does. It is premature to reject Ptolemy's model in favor of Copernicus's model um, because Copernicus's model, even though it may have some pleasing features, such as uniform circular motion, such as simple explanation of retrograde, it's no simpler and it doesn't do as well. So, you know. Back in the day of Copernicus's day, it actually made sense for scientists to not immediately jump and say, oh, he's got it. It's right on board. So I'm going to stop there. I actually had one more slide, but I'm going to not do it because it is uh, 11 o'clock, SLT, 14 o'clock where I am. Uh, and I will stop and I will... Uh, is it a yes? You know what? I always intend to send you those and I always forget to. So I will send you PDF and I will try to send you all my PDFs from this year. <laughs> um, I just keep, I always, I never remember to do anything. So yes, I will send in PDFs of all these things so that you'll have them.
and so folks can come back later and look at them and actually see my little uh, Taylor series expansion of a potential. Huh, about a minimum. Does anyone have any other questions or other things that they want to uh, bring up? Aha! Day Miami, next week, Evolution and Stephen Jay Gould. So, if you want to find out about uh, science that is completely settled that people still don't believe exists, there you go. What time is it next week? Is it next Saturday at 10 a.m.? Ah, there you go. Full detail. All right, how long did it, t did it take for it really take hold? Uh... That's a hard question, partly because it took hold over time. Um, Galileo fully believed it, and he had observations that showed it made way more sense. Um, Kepler modified it to make it really work. And so after Kepler, we're talking right about 1600, Kepler and Newton, pretty much it was settled, but the Catholic Church didn't stop making believing in heliocentrism naughty until something like the 18th century. Um, and even as recently as this century, they tried to get together and um, uh, say that Galileo wasn't bad, and they kind of failed to do that. So yeah, the, the church was pretty slow to come around, and of course there are people today, yeah, flat earthers believe, I don't know, if they don't even believe in centers, right, because it's all flat. So, yeah, there are people today who don't even believe the world is round. So you can find some people who got everything wrong. When I was at Vanderbilt at one point, I got this extensive uh, self-published book by some guy uh, who was trying to expose modern science's fraud and believing in heliocentrism and how geocentrism was really right and things like that. But as a whole, it would be about a century later when the scientific community as a whole had pretty much accepted that Copernicus's model was a better description. But given that Ptolemy's model gave you better predictions, you know, in the early 16th century, it, it wouldn't have been widely accepted. Yeah, you know, it's sort of interesting because Pope John Paul II, I don't know how long ago, decades ago, came out and said, hey, the Catholic Church is cool with evolution. Um, uh, but I think he, he failed to officially get Galileo recommunicated or something like that. Yeah, so Indian astrophysics, um, I, I mentioned that early on in the talk. Uh, there was, uh, I forget the guy's name, but but had um, heliocentric models. Yeah, Arya Bahada was the one that, that I mentioned. And, of course, there were some of the ancient Greeks who had it as well. And uh, I think it was Sissy G was saying that there must have been ancient tribes of people who did notice Uranus and just didn't record it. So we don't know today that they did, and that's probably right. And probably if, if you go as far back as people looking at the sky, there were probably somebody thinking about other ways for it to go, and most people just thought they were nut bar. Yeah, the, so the Earth's diameter, um, the the Indians did that. Also, again, the ancient Greeks did that. Um, I think it was Aristarchus who did that, but it might have been Hipparchus. I forget. Aristosthenes, thank you. He was the one who, by measuring shadows at two different latitudes, was able to come up with a pretty good measurement of Earth's orbit. I know, Baragon, that's really true. Um, and you can kind of see what it was like if you get out in a really good dark sky, although I think nowhere on Earth is as good as it once was. But if you get out in the middle of nowhere, I mean, especially if you get out on a boat in the middle of the ocean, um, you're going to, uh, you see way more than you do anywhere inside a city or even an appreciable town nowadays. Yeah, I mean, rural Minnesota, the problem is you look at the sky and while you're appreciating it, you freeze solid. Cultures use drawings to record their knowledge. Here's an interesting random factoid is that in 1054, there was a uh, supernova that we see today as the Crab Nebula, as the super, supernova remnant. Nobody in Europe recorded it. If they did, the, the, uh, the records are lost. So we have no evidence from Europe that this was seen, but Chinese astronomers recorded it. And so that's why we know exactly where it was, and we know that that was the supernova that led to the Crab Nebula, because they recorded where it was. There's also drawings on um, Native American uh, ruins in the 
American Southwest that based on the date drawings of a bright star, some suggest was actually a record of that supernova. So here's another thing that's worth, uh, um, I don't know enough about uh, the turning of viewpoint following Copernicus mentioned by Kant to actually have a coherent opinion on that, I fear. Uh, I just want to uh, mention something that uh, that SR was saying, that the Indian astronomers had this idea. India, uh, Indian mathematicians are also to thank for our modern numbering system. We talk about Hindu, uh, we talk about uh, Arabic numerals. They're actually really Hindu Arabic numerals, and that the Arabs got them from Europe and then added the concept of zero, which is very important as well. But our modern numbering system was invented uh, in India way back in the day and eventually made its way to the Arab world and a few hundred later to Europe and allows you to do things that Roman numerals just can't do. So, uh, oh, it, it did. Oh, thank you, Vic. I guess the Vatican did absolve Galileo in 1992. Yeah, so the, uh, I know, a number zero turns out to be extremely exciting and kind of a weird concept if you, I mean, we're so used to having zero that we don't even know that there's something weird about it. But. So yeah, so we're, in the Western world, we tend to look back to Copernicus and think everything was European, but it's very true that uh, the Arab world and India contribute a lot of the stuff that, that Europeans built on and did other stuff with, so yeah. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Um, next week, Day is going to be talking about uh, punctuated equilibrium and evolution. And watch the website and the announcements to see what else is coming. All right. Oops, I wanted to do this one. Which button is my wave button? I have a wave button, but it's not working. So never mind, I won't wave. I'll just say goodbye and catch you all later. <laughs>